So now, uh, it's a pleasure and honor for me to introduce an old friend and collaborator from way back, uh, who has played a very important role in... Is this it? Played a very important role in the Ricci flow and other flows, as well as other subjects in geometry. Uh, in particular, his uh, early work on the Kahler Ricci flow, which is brilliant, proving a, a convergence to Kahler Einstein metrics in C1 negative or zero, and also his beautiful proof of the Harnack inequality for the Ricci flow, uh, and more recent work, uh, of which we'll hear some today. And I, he's also been a real workhorse for JDG, running it out of Lehigh for many years now. So we all owe him a debt of gratitude here. And uh, I'm happy to introduce Huai Dong Kao, who will speak on uh, geometry and stability of Ricci solitons, which sounds very interesting to me. Thank, thank you, Richard. Thank you for the kind words. Um, and it is great uh, honor and pleasure to speak uh, at this special occasion. Um, actually, as I mentioned, 35 years ago, I was first year graduate student at Princeton. Uh, in, uh, I started in uh, late fall of 81. And in spring of 82, uh, Professor Hamilton came, as you may heard from Professor Yao and himself. Uh, and he gave uh, a, a talk, and title is Three Manifolds uh, with Positive Ricci Curvature. At the time, I was uh, just arrived about six months. English wasn't, in mathematics was, uh, uh, you know, so-so, uh, and my, particularly my geometry, minimal. Um, so halfway through of the talk, I was uh, saying to myself, uh, where's the first example? Because I thought that was three <laughs> manifolds of positive rich curvature, so you can see how ignorant I was. Uh, <laughs> but the most scary is uh, right after uh, Professor Hamilton's talk, uh, Professor Yao asked a few of us, myself, Ben Chao, and uh, also uh, Mark. At the time, uh, he were, Mark was the instructor at the uh, Princeton Institute, and asked us to go over. Uh, Richard's paper uh, on the Ricci flow. Uh, that was the most scary moment for me because I barely know anything about remaining geometry, I have to admit, uh, now. So, uh, but well, that was the way that, uh, thank, thankfully, Richard wrote down everything in coordinates. So, uh, <laughs> wasn't any fancy uh, <laughs> uh, covariant, uh, so I was able to pick up uh, uh, the, the, the geometry along the way. And we, uh, we made the presentation, but Mark helped the most, so Ben Chao and also helped. So that, I never thought I would be able to associate with Richie Fro for most of the next 35 years. But thanks to Professor Yao, he uh, uh, really uh, had a vision how important the Richie Fro would be, and will be, you know, even just by back then, as Richard mentions. So that was the first JDG paper. I, I really went through uh, several times. I think I can uh, recite uh, essentially all the estimates. Uh, the second year, I have to say, is the uh, Yao uh, asked me to uh, look at the Ricci flow on Kahler manifolds, particularly the final case with positive C1. And that was the second scary moment because I knew little, nothing almost about Kahler geometry. But of course, I wouldn't dare to tell him so, right? <laughs> so, so I went through, uh, you know, uh, tried to learn the Kahler geometry uh, and also the, the estimates, C, C0, C, you know, C2, C3 estimates. But fortunately, also Kalabi was visiting the institute in the uh, spring uh, of, that was a year later, of 83. So he lectured on vanishing theorems in uh, Kahler geometry. So uh, that was helped a lot. Uh, and Yao uh, uh, gave me two other papers. Well, he didn't really say read the Kalabi conjecture, but he actually asked me to read the uh, Kalabi's extreme metric paper. So 
those are the three first papers that I really read. Uh, I learned the, the, the geometry thing to start with. So the Ricci flow on three manifold, the Calabi conjecture, and Calabi's extreme metric. But after San Diego, uh, well, you know, I think I'm very lucky, really. And Rick uh, was lecturing on Yamabi conjectures and uh, variational structures, and later on positive mass theorem. So uh, the, that was really great. I, 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 I'm, I feel very fortunate. So I had learned all these uh, Ricci flow, the Kähler geometry, and geometric analysis through my great teachers. So here I want to also pay tribute to, uh, to, to them. So today I'm going to uh, 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 speak on a small part of the singularity analysis from Ricci flow that you heard Richard talk about. And uh, so that will be uh, the limiting singularity models. And that uh, is called the Ricci soliton. And that was the notion introduced by uh, Richard uh, in mid 80s. So let's see what the, uh, so my plan is to, uh, to recall the definition of Ricci solitons, and then I uh, explain two motivations. One from parabolic viewpoint, that's the Ricci flow and the singularity formations. Second is variational structure, which trace, of course, back to the classical uh, Einstein Hilbert actions, and here's extension. And, and then we'll go through some low dimensional classifications results we know, and also. Uh, some stability questions, but main aim is try to see what we can do and what uh, the difficulties are in dimension four. Okay, so with this, so let me uh, start. Oops. Yeah. Okay, so a gradient uh, Ricci solitons are simply a, a special class of uh, remaining manifold. So here we assume complete, either compact or non-compact, uh, together with a special function, f, satisfying the Ricci curvature. That's the uh, uh, Ricci curvature here, plus the Hessian of the function is proportional to metric. And of course, uh, uh, this without the uh, Hessian term, that's precise the Einstein matrix. And this F we call the potential functions. Okay, so we're looking for uh, a, a triple, uh, such a manifold and metric and potential function, satisfy the uh, extended Einstein equation. Now that's the Ricci soliton equation. Um, of course, as in the Einstein case, we have three cases that depend on constant rho, whether it's positive, zero, and uh, negative. And according to uh, the Ricci flow, Richard uh, named them shrinking solitons, steady solitons, and expanding solitons. Because if you have a positive Einstein metric, like sphere, then under the Ricci flow, will shrink uh, to a smaller, small size of the same geometry, uh, that's shrinking, and if you have hyperbolic metrics, of course, we'll be expanding homothetically. In steady case, it's just stationary. Now, uh, so f equal to constant, as we mentioned, the all Hessian equal to zero. Uh, zero. Uh, that's exactly the Einstein case. Uh, I want to just briefly remark that this is, there's a more general version when the gradient of f is replaced by a general vector field. So in this case, will have Ricci plus the lead derivative of the metric in the direction of vector field V proportional to it. But for us, the gradient soliton uh, has the best structure and also arising from singularity models. So we concentrate on the special case V is the gradient of F. All right, so of course, special examples are which coming from Einstein case, if any Einstein manifold clearly is a special Ricci soliton. But of course, when we say really Ricci soliton, we want F to be non-trivial. And the second case, interestingly, is on the flat Euclidean space. Uh, we care the metric is zero, uh, flat, so Ricci curvature is zero, but we have non-trivial potential functions. And so that 
for, for, for example, in the uh, case uh, rho is equal to half, and we pick the quadratic function uh, Gaussian, then we have exactly Ricci plus the Hessian is equal to one half of the metric G. So that's a, a, a non-compact, flat, but non-trivial potential function Gaussian solitons. And we can always form the product uh, of the Einstein manifold of the, of the with same constant uh, with the, uh, the Euclidean. So those are sort of always there. The question is, would we have others? And we'll see uh, later. Now, as we said, the, uh, these are extension of Einstein manifolds, uh, but for the parabolic case, this is a special self-similar uh, solution to, the, to our, uh, the Ricci flow. And uh, this case is like in Einstein case, if vector field is zero, you just have homothety. And uh, when the vector field is added, we just have a family of diffeomorphism uh, uh, gauges, a gauge uh, uh, together with the homothety. So you have a uh, uh, change of coordinates plus the homothety. And uh, that's the case. And so self-similar solution often appears in the singularity analysis as dilation of limit, as well see and as Richard explained in the, uh, his lecture. Uh, so these solutions will be model possible singularity of the Ricci flow, and uh, you already seen the neck pinch and, uh, uh, and the degenerate neck pinch. So turns out the shrinking ones are like the cylinder, like the sphere are type one solutions or singularity models. Steady solution like a Brine's soliton, Brine's ball are type two. And so that's from neck pinch and degen neck pinch. So I don't have to say anything about those, thanks to Richard's beautiful drawing. Uh, and from elliptic point of view, as we said, these will be uh, critical points and uh, coming from variational structures. So uh, Paraman, particularly Paraman defined uh, lambda entropy and new entropy for shrinking and steady solitons. So we're going to see a little bit of that. And uh, also, as Richard mentioned, uh, that these uh, expanding solitons particularly uh, becomes identity on the Liao Hamilton differential Harnack estimate for the Ricci flow. Uh, also, I was told that there, there are links with the conformal field theory, but I do not understand that topic uh, well enough, so I'm, uh, yeah, but there's a link with mathematical physics and physics in that was I told. So quickly, the Ricci flow, well, you already heard, so I'm fortunate just following the lecture here. Uh, is the, the parabolic heat equation uh, introduced by uh, uh, Richard 35 years ago, more actually. And the scalar curvature particularly is satisfy uh, a heat equation type with some nonlinearity. And this uh, has been powerful tools in geometry uh, and topology such as the Pre conjecture, first in geometrization conjecture, but also in geometry by uh, Rick and uh, Simon Brander to prove the quarter pinch result also using the Ricci flow. Uh, now let's start with the, uh, the, the very first paper and the result uh, that Hamilton proved in 1982, JDG paper, that if we have a compact three manifold and with initial metric of positive Ricci curvature, then uh, the Ricci flow preserves the positivity of Ricci curvature and will shrink because the minus to Ricci term on the right. Uh, but as it shrink, it will become round in the sense if we rescale to keep constant the volume, then the limit will be uh, the metric of constant sectional curvature. And that, of course, will be space form and quotient of S3. And I think this is still no uh, elliptic uh, proof of this result uh, up to today. Uh, uh, yeah. So this uh, is the, the powerful, uh, uh, showing the powerful uh, feature of the Ricci flow. Uh, so as we mentioned, that such a manifold will be quotient of S3. All right. Um, and I want to briefly say that uh, 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 a, couple, a few years later, 
uh, Richard was, uh, did the uh, two-dimensional case. Turns out, in his words, two-dimensional is harder for Ricci flow because that resembles actually the Kähler, Kähler case. Uh, in the sense that the point-wise estimate no longer works uh, in the three-dimension case, everything is point-wise estimate, maximum principle. But the uh, S2 case turns out you need the uh, Harnack uh, and the integral estimates, etc. But anyway, uh, on any uh, topological S2, that's the hardest case in surface case, is for any initial metric on topological S2 will become, after a short time, uh, become positive Gauss curvature. That's the work of Ben Chow. And then Richard shows that once become positive Gauss curvature, it will converge. But interesting enough, he didn't really show right away that converges to the S2. He showed that the convergence, well, uh, to something uh, interesting quantity uh, that later on will be just the Ricci soliton. So, right, to, you prove that actually converge two-dimensional shrinking solitons and then analyze the, that case and show that two-dimensional shrinking soliton uh, has to be the round sphere. So that was the beginning, I think, almost uh, the, 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 the Ricci soliton becomes uh, uh, involved with the singularity models. Anyway, uh, so uh, in three-dimensional case, I'll skip these. You have neck pinch and the general neck pinch. Uh, and in general, you, uh, if we encounter a finite time singularity, which means the curvature is going to be blow up in finite time. Uh, and that's what we call develop finite time singularity uh, as T approach the uh, capital T when curvature goes to infinite. Uh, and uh, Richard classified it, as in other cases, uh, the two types, uh, one compact, in this case, only two types. Depends on the rate of curvature blowing up. If it's uh, basically on the order of the uh, time remaining, that's type one. And otherwise, that will be type two. So type one, well, see, will be like the sphere shrink to uh, uh, a point, or cylinder shrink to a line. In the type two case is more like degenerate neck pinch. So anyway, uh, here is the standard technique that you do the parabolic rescaling uh, if the curvature, say here in the neck, approaching to the pinch or cone, then you rescale to make the curvature, the maximum curvature to be one, and you dilate, and then uh, dilate more and more, you will get uh, more cylinder-like. Okay, so that's the, uh, the link with limiting singularity model uh, actually was uh, in these two, typically, for type two. Uh, we need the, some positivity on the curvature. Uh, so if we do dilate, the limiting solution, uh, if has the non-active curvature operator, or in the Kähler case, non-active holomorphic bisectional curvature, then that type two limit will be a so-called a steady soliton. By the way, these will be special case of something called eternal, not just uh, from minus t, but will be also lasting forever. And um, uh, so that's why the, uh, this uh, follows from the Hanak uh, inequality or the uh, Hamilton inequality we call differential Hanak. And uh, in, the, in the shrinking type one case, turns out we do not need any curvature uh, assumptions thanks to the paraments uh, functional that we're going to see later and also the uh, L function. Uh, that turns out any type one limit, if the original manifold of Ricci flow is compact and you develop uh, a type one singularity, you do scaling, the limiting model can be non-compact or compact. So in general, it was a result of Allen neighbor and, uh, uh, in, and, and later, uh, completed by Enders, uh, Miller, and Topping, that these type one limit uh, will be always a gradient shrinking soliton. So these are show the link between singularity models and the limiting case are gradient solitons. Okay, and if the limiting model is compact, then Natasha Session approved uh, before that. Okay.
So that's the parabolic ones. So quickly, I'll say just say a few words. These are more familiar. The uh, total scalar curvature, we have that. And if we do the first variation, we got the Einstein's equation. And in this case, it just reaches flat. If we further restrict the volume constraint to be, say, one, then the critical points will be Einstein metric. So these are well-known facts. And uh, um, so there's a similar uh, variational structure for Ricci solitons. So for example, for the steady case, uh, this functional coming from string theory, a special case, uh, uh, the F functional. But Paraman um, uh, did one more to, uh, because this function depends on both metric and arbitrary smooth function. So Paraman considered, like in the Hilbert uh, action case, is add a volume, weighted volume constraint. So if we do that, turns out uh, this one will be depends, of course, on metric only, but also can be realized by uh, smooth function. So inf is achieved. And if we, so if we then we do the variational, first variation, then the, uh, the critical points are precisely the uh, steady solitons. In this case, f is the minimizer of the lambda functional. Uh, for the uh, shrinking ones, uh, that's more complicated. Uh, so here is what uh, Paraman found out. There's an uh, extension to something called W functional, which is, I think, uh, now well known to the uh, flow people. And uh, similarly, he um, minimized among the smooth function and positive uh, constant parameter tau that again be, can be realized. And, um, and the first variation will give us uh, shrinking solitons. Uh, I think when he visited the MIT lecture on it, I asked him, uh, is there any uh, physical interpretations? Well, you know, a functional had from, from string theory. At the time, he said, he paused for a few seconds, said, well, uh, there, this comes from years of trying to understand Hamilton's work. But of course now, uh, we know there's some, uh, like the, the Nash uh, entropy and also tied to the log Sobolev, so uh, there's other things, but, uh, uh, but he, I think for this, he, he really wanted some <laughs> monotonicity formulas. So we don't know how many years, uh, probably seven or six or five years, uh, figured this out, so it becomes very useful. So as we said, if you do the first variation, then the critical points will be, uh, in this case, tau is positive. So exactly uh, the, uh, the shrinking reaches allotons. And in this case, all we have is a potential function coming from the minimizing process. OK. Now, clearly, the, with this, the main question is try to classify, if possible, or if not, try at least understand the geometry, geometric features of, uh, of these three charlatans. Uh, and also important, as in the Einstein uh, example, is to construct new Ricci solitons because these examples, if it's interesting, will give us intuitions and guide us even to ask, make conjectures or, uh, or approach the, the, the interesting quantities. So these, uh, since, um, yeah, have been there. So I'll, I'll skip some of the equations. So you came from the, the, the soliton structure equation, you got uh, many nice relations between scalar curvature, the Laplace F, a gradient of F, particularly here the, uh, the F is sort of the uh, Witten Laplace in sort of eigenvalues or twist Laplace eigenvalues. And uh, these are just the resemblance of the uh, evolution equations of scalar and the Ricci uh, in um, Richard's first paper. How and these here because the DDT essentially is the gradient f direction. So these are just uh, translate from the Ricci flow uh, evolution equations. Um, we'll see that they will play a, a role later, of course. So now uh, from now on, so it turns out the uh, study index. Uh, all these three types behave rather differently. So for today, I'm going to concentrate on type one. So that would be shrinking case. And we normalize the constant B will be one half. Okay, so Ricci, so maybe I write it down here. Oh, 
So that will be the equation that we're going to look at, so extension of positive Einstein case. Okay, uh, in dimension two, as I mentioned, the only compact ones, uh, shrinking ones, are around the, the quotient of S2. So in this case, we have S2 and RP2. And also, if it's, there's no non-compact one except uh, the flat uh, R2, the, the Gaussian solitons. Turns out uh, uh, that we cannot construct any rotational symmetric ones on Rn. Uh, you can do uh, away from origin, but there's no way that you can extend through uh, smoothly to make a smooth metric at the origin. That was uh, uh, Robert Bryant did. So you can do the steady ones on Rn with positive curvature, but not a complete metric uh, on Rn, so except the, uh, the flat Gaussian solitons. So in three dimension, uh, whereas the a work of IV, Tom IV, that uh, three-dimensional compact shrinking soliton is also have to be run as a quotient of S3, and this, of course, is actually a consequence of the famous Hamilton IV pinching theorem for three-dimensional Ricci flow, because first of all, you will have to pinch towards a positive curvature, but it, uh, it's self-similar, and so it, yeah, and, uh, and then you have to be round, but it's self-similar, so it has been round all along. Yeah, okay. Now, uh, in the non-compact case, uh, I think the, the really the subject got revived uh, since Paraman's work uh, 15 years ago. So what, as a part of singularity analysis, as you heard from Richard, uh, what Paraman were able to prove is uh, if we have a three-dimensional shrinking soliton, which, of course, first you come from ancient solution, uh, either cylinder or the brine ball, but in the, in the rubber brine case, you can take a sequence of points, go to infinity, do a blowdown, and that is also sort of cylinder-like. That's become shrinking soliton. So in, in, but Richard was able to essentially prove this, but needed the, uh, the uh, uh, the um, non-collapsing. So Paraman supplied non I, I forgot to add that the Paraman has uh, put the extra condition of non-collapsing there. So he was able to prove if it's uh, non-collapsed with bonded and non-negative sectional curvature, then you have only these standard ones, the sphere, uh, the Gaussian soliton R3, and the cylinder. Uh, in particular, if you had uh, the, uh, the, non, the positive and bonded curvature, it has to be compact. So you don't have any non-compact such things with positive curvature. And so that was uh, essentially saying interesting one is either you are uh, flowing to the singularity look like S3 or it's a neck pinch or degenerate neck pinch. As, uh, as Richard pointed out, he, uh, he always observed the uh, but needed the uh, injectivity to estimate. Okay, uh, and uh, a few years later, we tried to understand uh, three dimension, his argument. So maybe I say a, few, uh, a word about it. So what Paraman did, the proof actually is very geometric. So uh, suppose you have non-compact one with positive curvature. You take a sequence of points going to infinity and with the non-collapsing argument, you can take a limit. And he shows that limit is around the cylinder. So at infinity, it is rotational symmetric. Uh, and then he uh, used the positive section of curvature to say the potential function actually is convex. So you look at the level sets of the potential function, those are convex. So, and as you approach the infinity, they become more and more round, like S2. So he then argues by look at the gauss bonnet how the curvature uh, look like and how the area look like, and you plug into gauss bonnet formula, you got a contradiction. And uh, it's a very geometric argument. But he needed non-collapsing and needed curvature to be bounded in order to take, uh, to get the, a limit of the sequence of dilations. Um, yeah. So, we, uh, so we, if we're going to work in high dimensions, we try to at least understand his argument in looking for dimension four, uh, particularly. Uh, so uh, 
In this case, a few years later, uh, my collaborator, Bin Long Chen and Xi Pinzhu, we were able to remove all the curvature assumptions. So like, like a bounded curvature particularly, uh, because in general, if you, so in the Paramount's case, he, he, it's good enough because he take uh, the, the point uh, when dilation near the maximum curvature or proportion to max curvature, so you have curvature bounded anyway. Uh, but as we do non-compact other cases, you want to remove the bounded curvature as Richard's talk uh, saying there, because it can be non-unbounded. Uh, so that's, that's the thing. Uh, and uh, our work was uh, based on the partial result was by uh, Leigh and Warlock that they first proved this under some as assumptions that the Ricci is non-active and the curvature can be uh, uh, exponential decay with a small exponent A. Uh, so here the crucial uh, work coming out actually is Bin Long Chen. He showed that without curvature bond, any ancient three-dimensional uh, Ricci flow will automatically have non-active sectional curvatures. So that's extension of the Hamilton IV pinching when you don't have the curvature bond. So in three dimension, uh, there's some sort of feature as uh, for scalar curvature, in the, but not quite involved in the in 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 the involved the uh, the uh, situation for the. Uh, the differential Harnock, that is a different story, but hopefully some feature maybe uh, yeah, can work through. Uh, so uh, we'll maybe hear another talk from Richard after he finished that. All right, uh, anyway, so uh, in our case actually we more used uh, the uh, different from Paraman, like, like Laney and Warlock, we do is uh, more use the pinching uh, evolution equations what uh, uh, Richard used in his first paper. Anyway, uh, so let me move on. So four dimension quickly, neighbor was able to extend four dimension, again need the curvature to be bounded and non-active, but without uh, uh, non-collapsing. And these again are the standard cases, R4, and the cylinder in two different dimensions. So four dimension, that's okay with bounded non-active curvature operator in this case. Uh, and then the other natural extension, because three-dimension viral curvature is zero, so naturally you're looking for locally conformally flat case, viral curvature equal to zero, and there's a group of uh, uh, particularly three works, uh, uh, three Italian mathematicians here, and Ni Wallach and Zhu Hongzhan from China were able to prove a similar result uh, for these case, but actually there are uh, uh, quite a few other proofs, particularly by Peterson and Wiley, and Sheldon Tao and Bing Wan, and uh, um, uh, Zhang Zhou, and with some assumption, technical assumptions readily moved by uh, Ovidio Montiano and Natasha Session. So anyway, uh, this is okay in all dimensions. And I want to briefly mention in four dimension, as we heard from Cliff uh, Taub's talk, interesting is half conformally, uh, the, uh, the self-dual, anti-self-dual. So in this case, we can look at the so-called half conformally flat case when uh, W plus or W minus equal to zero. Then you also have uh, a nice classification is either Einstein or otherwise have to be um, the standard uh, uh, actually will be conformally flat. So non-compact will be R4 or cylinder. And uh, combined with a result uh, of Hitchin in the late 70s, I believe, then these will be, has to be S4 and CP2. So if it's uh, compact and half conformally flat, shrinking soliton then has to be S4 and CP2. We'll come back to this a bit later. And one more extension I want to mention is so-called the Bach flat case. And we can prove the exactly same result in the Bach flat case. And for dimension n equal to four, uh, Bach flat is weaker than locally conformal to Einstein or a half conformally flat. And it's also interesting, the Bach tensor, which is two derivative, two divergence of viral tensor plus contraction of rich with viral, uh, appears, of course, in the uh, relativity, particularly conformal relativities and conformal geometry. And it's uh, a nice feature is it's uh, divergence-free, 
and trace free. And so we hope to explore this one again uh, yeah, in future. Yeah. Okay, so these are with the sort of uh, uh, special uh, assumptions on the, the, the viral part or viral part related. What about um, general? So we want to understand shrinking solitons in general, particularly compact and non-compact case. So we start with non-compact one first. So in the non-compact case, uh, turns out um, there's one very nice feature. So recall that uh, uh, for Gaussian soliton Rn, the potential function is the leading order is equal to one quarter of distance squared. Turns out for any non-compact radiation shrinking solitons, that feature is exactly, uh, it also precisely holds, at least asymptotically. So this says the potential function near the infinity is bounded above and below by one quarter of distance squared. Uh, that is kind of surprising and uh, also says the infinity is well behaved. Um, uh, that turns out to be quite useful later on, and this is a joint work with De Tanzo in Brazil and myself. And by the way, this is second uh, my JDG paper. Uh, it turns out to be useful. The first one was 20 years ago, 97, uh, for the singularity uh, models. And, uh, and uh, so, yeah, so I'm glad that this actually has been used quite often. Uh, in dealing with non-compact ones. The nice thing is without any assumptions. So this says this equation has uh, a, a lot of hidden informations yeah, in the non-compact case. Also, uh, oh, also by, in this case actually, uh, when Ricci is non-bounded, uh, then that was approved by Paraman uh, before. So we were able to just remove the bounds on Ricci curvature. And uh, the other thing I want to say very nice is in general is we have volume controls. Uh, in the same paper, we observed that volume has to be uh, at most Euclidean type, so maximum volumes. So this behaves like the Ricci curvature non-active, uh, the Bishop uh, volume estimates. And that turns out to be useful if we do any integration by part techniques. And another uh, one that is Calabi Yao type volume estimate says the volume growth is at least linear. That is also a feature from non active Ricci curvature. So, um, and this is by uh, Ovidio Montiano and Japin Wan uh, shortly after. Okay, so we got control on the volume, we control on the potential function. So, what about curvature? So, curvature is uh, uh, we only in general have some scalar curvatures. Turns out, in these cases, Bin chain proved any ancient solution uh, without curvature uh, being bounded from above always has non-active scalar curvature. So that's uh, another one using the local sort of Hamilton IV and Paramount's distance function uh, kind of technique. So in this case, uh, given the equation we had before, R plus, um, where the S squared F is basically equal to F plus a constant. So in this case, if R is positive, and uh, wait a second, oh, so this is a positive, so this says R is less than equal to F, where F is quadratic growth. So particularly scalar curvature in this case is at most quadratic growth, but we don't have any example <laughs> with uh, unbounded again. And it turns out also if you analyze a little bit more, this has to be strictly positive unless we are on the flat Gaussian soliton. Now, uh, another nice feature is without any assumptions, uh, using our uh, function, potential function estimate, uh, Ben Chao and his collaborator were able to prove that uh, there's a lower bound up to the quadratic de decay. So that, that turns out to be also very useful in later works by Montiano and Japing Wan. Anyway, um, so here is a nice, very nice compactness theorem extending paramens and other cases. So, and the neighbors case, uh, results in 40. So here's uh, with 
sectional curvature are non-active. So uh, just very recently, uh, this actually I think is going to appear in JDG, um, maybe the coming issue, is that we have, if we have a complete gradient to reach isolaton uh, with non-active sectional curvature, then either it's compact or has to be a finite quotient of Gaussian soliton or the higher dimensional sort of cylinders way with Einstein manifold, the part of Ricci and non-active sectional curvature. And what they prove uh, is a conjecture about 10 years, I think, standing there, uh, that there's, if you had uh, a gradient shrinking soliton with positive Ricci curvature and non-active sectional curvature, then it has to be compact, so it's compactness theorem. And before even with the curvature operator was uh, open um, for a while, uh, actually didn't know until this result. The nice feature is the proof actually is quite clever, but not too involved. So this will be the simplest argument proving all previous sort of compactness uh, result. So I'll probably say a few words about it. And in this case, is we follow the uh, uh, Ricci uh, evolution, or in this case, the parabolic version of the Ricci curvature. So in this case, uh, the equation La plus F is essentially like heat operator. So La plus F is equal to La plus minus gradient F dot with the gradient. So it's the, um, so that, this term essentially like a DDT direction in the Ricci flow. So you have the familiar how the Ricci uh, tends to evolve. And the sectional curvature or curvature operator appears here. So Richard certainly, uh, <laughs> yeah, that's from your computation. Uh, the own, so now suppose we are proved by contradiction. Suppose we have a non-compact shrinking soliton with non-active sectional curvature and positive Ricci curvature. Then we take the least eigenvalue of the Ricci curvature at each point, and this becomes a function lambda x. Now, if you look at this equation, and when the Ricci diagonalize, it's positive, and uh, the sectional curvature non-active makes this term non-active. So you just, we just throw away. So this says the least eigenvalue of Ricci satisfies such uh, uh, differential inequality. La plus F lambda is less than equal to lambda, but of course in the sense of distribution because lambda may not be smooth uh, enough. Uh, so on the other hand, so this is just one slice campaign. On the other hand, using the fact that the potential function satisfies its eigenvalue of the uh, drift Laplacian and the maxim Prince argument, which resembles what Ben Charner or used in the proof of the scalar curvature bond then you can prove, actually they proved, Ricci curvature uh, has at most a quadratic decay or, or some constant over the potential function for some kind. Now, you use the fact that the scalar curvature, the gradient or differential is twice of Ricci applied to the grad F, and you integrate along the, uh, uh, look at the, how the, uh, the scalar curvature varies, and then you prove that scalar curvature actually has to be grow in the log of the F. But now that is contradiction to a fact that the time Zhou and myself proved in the same paper for potential function that average scalar curvature is always bonded and you got the contradiction. So that's a beautiful <laughs> argument using the, and here the only place this, the section of curvature is uh, here that you throw it away. So actually, um, based on that there's no example of positive rich curvature and non-compact, I, uh, I, uh, I conjecture that uh, probably you don't need the non-active section of curvature, but proof is harder. So uh, the question or conjecture is, if you have non-compact shrinking soliton with positive rich curvature, then that has to be compact. But I don't know how to prove it. Uh, and only suggest by examples. So anyway, that's the first uh, open problem. Maybe our uh, students with uh, some remaining geometry background may, you know, may become, be able to prove it. Uh, uh, anyway. So uh, I haven't mentioned any non-trivial examples. So uh, let me mention in four dimension four, 
Actually, uh, we don't really know many examples. In dimension four, there are only two compact ones. Uh, both are Kähler. So the first one is on the uh, P1 bundle over P1, or CP2 blob one point, and that was found by Koizo, and later on my, uh, at the around the same time by myself independently. And this one has a rotational symmetry, so you essentially reuse the ODE. And there's high, high dimensional analog. By the way, this one actually turns out to have positive Ricci curvature. Uh, I observed that. And the second one, it's harder, which, oh, I did forget, was more in 2000s, about 10 or 15 years later, that uh, Xu Jia Wan and uh, Xiao Hua Zhu were able to uh, construct one or CP to blob two points. And in this case, it's the uh, toric uh, S1 cross S1 symmetry, so you have to solve a real margin per equation of two real variables. Uh, there's also one non compact example which lives on so called a tautological line bundle over P1 or just the C2 blow up one point. Uh, this example is cone like at the infinity, so curvature decays uh, quadratically but does not have. Um, the Ricci curvature doesn't have the sign because of the blow up. Scalar curvature is positive. So this is the only one in dimension four, the non-compact one we know. Okay, cone-like and quadratic key, but Ricci curvature changes the sign. And so based on this, I, I, that's my, my conjecture. There's, you know, if it's rotational symmetric, one doesn't have the uh, Ricci, then possibly none of the others would have. But of course, we don't know the remaining. We don't have any single examples of shrinking Ricci Salton, just the period remaining non kala And that's a huge challenge. So, uh, so I don't know about, uh, yeah, uh, if you have a non-rotational symmetric ones, maybe. So I, I suspect, uh, I, I sort of believe this should, at least there's another one. Uh, but we are in the process of trying to construct the, uh, the other one. And, uh, yeah, so hopefully we can have at least two examples. Anyway, uh, so let me report some more recent uh, development on four dimension towards a classification, at least for non-compact case, because we know non-compacts much better than the compact one because of infinity, how they behave. So uh, the first uh, such encouraging results coming from uh, Brad Kochwa and uh, Lu Wan which uh, this one I think appeared in uh, 2015 in JDG, uh, saying if two uh, non-compact shrinking ones, they asymptotic to the same cone at infinity, then they have to be isometric. So essentially, again, the infinity cone-like determines the shrinking soliton. So of course, you can think this is like sort of uh, a boundary value problem at infinity, right? So if at infinity is then, uh, but proof actually was quite elaborate using the um, backward heat, uh, backward Ricci flow, the uniqueness, and use Kalman, uh, non-trivial Kalman type estimates because here actually you don't have to be complete. Anyway, uh, so this uh, is the uh, uh, a nice direction. And more interestingly is a result by Montiano Japping one that in four dimension, uh, if scalar curvature assumed goes to zero at the infinity, then it must be asymptotic to uh, a smooth cone. So here you have some assumption on the scalar curvature, but uh, that turns out uh, if scalar curvature doesn't, probably we, we, we suspect it may be a cylinder, maybe you have a splitting, but that's yet to be proven. But anyway, this is a, a nice, very nice case, just assuming scalar curvature decay, it got asymptotic to cone. And uh, so the open problem now in 4D for non-compact one is to understand what kind of shrinking solitons supports cone-like structures? So what type of cone or uh, the, the link can actually give us a shrinking soliton? And uh, that yet to be understood, but this becomes more hopeful. And to, to reduce to something, uh, the link uh, for the cone of three dimensions. So must, I, I think we think must be something special, cannot be arbitrary three-dimensional stuff. Uh, I want to describe, mention two uh, key estimates. 
One is, in this case, assume the scalar curvature is bound, they actually can prove our absolute value. Uh, the, the entire curvature operator will be bounded uh, in constant uh, times scalar curvature. So the, 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 the uh, significance is when scalar curvature going to zero at infinity, then the entire curvature operator have to go to zero too. So scalar curvature controls the whole curvature tensor. That's uh, a bit uh, uh, impressive. And the second one is the curvature operator, in some sense, is asymptotically non-active because f goes to quadratic uh, growth. And so this says, outside compact set, you're, you're going to be really become almost. So this is sort of uh, uh, Hamilton uh, IV pinching, in some sense, weak version in for the uh, shrinking solitons. But of course, we have the exact equations. Uh, it's not just the flow. Uh, a special feature is that the curvature can be bounded because the level set of potential functions three dimension, so uh, and uh, the uh, normal direction can be using the Sarton equation. So anyway, the curvature can be reduced to the rich curvature and the gradient rich curvature. So I will not go into any details. So I may be using the, what time did I start? Uh, probably five minutes or a few more minutes. So uh, yeah, so this is the case of the uh, non-compact ones. So I think we have, we learn more in the non-compact because infinity seems well behaved. Now the question is, what about compact? Uh, actually, we don't know very little if the four manifold, four dimensional shrinking solitum is compact because there's no boundary in the other things, uh, except we know it's always uh, pi one, it's finite. And uh, yeah. And so we're going to explore the variational structures. So uh, that is what uh, Richard uh, suggested, you know, for study the flow. Maybe uh, we don't care about all type of singularity, but those are more stable in the sense. So we're going to explore in the compact case the at least the uh, variational structure. Uh, so this started actually with uh, Tom Yoneman and Richard that uh, we uh, look at the uh, variational feature. And then the second, if we look at the second, so first variation we see is the shrinking soliton of this W functional um, uh, complex locking. But if we compute the second variation, then there's a nice uh, Jacobi operator, the stability operator. So very much resembles uh, what the Mu Tao uh, one talked about uh, yesterday, because there are variations of the Ricci curve to Einstein equation. So this uh, this part is the the, the part of involving Lich Norwich operator, and there's other divergence and divergence star. And this term is uh, a odd locking one that doesn't appear in uh, Einstein equation variations. And there's some other terms. So anyway. Um, there's this operator, so, and also it is well known on compact manifold, we can decompose the symmetric two tensors, which is the tangent space of, uh, on the space of metrics into, first of all, by kernel of divergence, elliptic operator, and then Im image of the divergent star, like in linear algebra. Uh, for Einstein manifold, we can do more. Uh, if it's not the sphere, then we have uh, a three-way decomposition uh, this one, it's like here, is coming from diffeomorphism. So it's the gauge part that then really uh, just change the gauge. The second part is the conformal one that uh, appears in all the conformal geometry or well, yeah, might be from other things. And the third part is uh, the essential part, which is called the uh, tr transverse and traceless. So kernel of divergence and kernel of the trace. And uh, so you have a three-way decomposition. So we can look at the variation in these Brock decompositions. And uh, we analyze how the, uh, the operator, the um, second variation look like in these different components. So the first, the uh, diffeomorphism invariant part is in the now space of the, ver ver the Jacobi operator. Uh, and if we restrict on the conformal part, then uh, the, the variation is, um, 
say positive, well, we are looking at the monotone increasing, so this is unstable case. So if it's linearly unstable, then it corresponds to the eigenvalue of blah, blah plus function on functions is less than the tau. Tau is the coefficient uh, equal to here, one over two tau, so tau will be equal to one, for example. And the third part, the transverse traceless part, that's the usual Lichnovich operator, so it depends on Lichnovich Laplace and what's the eigenvalue. So anyway, uh, the corollary is, if we have an Einstein manifold, of course we look at the Einstein manifold then, and, but with the W functional. Uh, say, if it's linearly stable, so second variation is non-positive, then corresponding to these two eigenvalue estimates for functions, and for each knowledge operator. And um, so reduced to eigenvalue estimate. Uh, so maybe I say what kind of examples. Uh, back then in 2004, we look at the, is any product metric of Einstein metric will be unstable because you can uh, say increase in, in one direction and decrease in one, like two spheres, uh, unless it's of the same size sort of, uh, or, but you can, even in that case, you can decrease one radius and increase becomes immediately unstable. And then the, the complex case is CPN is always uh, weakly stable, but any killer Einstein metaphor of positive Fado case, but with the Hodge number H11 is bigger than two. If you have another one, orthogonal, orthogonal to the Kähler form, then that direction gives you unstable direction. So you can turn the harmonic 1-1 one, one form into the Hermitian symmetric uh, a two tensor, and that actually the, the Weizenbach formula, et cetera, tells you that you have an unstable direction. So that turns out to be very convenient. Uh, interestingly is, uh, if the uh, Hodge number is equal to one, so we have, for example, complex hypochordric. So complex three-dimensional one is unstable, yet complex dimension four hypochordric is stable. So uh, um, there seems some differences that uh, maybe, uh, maybe uh, Professor de Maille could or others could tell us a little bit more what the, these features are. So anyway, uh, uh, last year we, uh, with Chen Shi He uh, at the UC Riverside now, we were able to classify uh, whether stable or unstable for all symmetric space of compact type ir irreducible. So here's just a list of dimension up to 10. Interestingly is, well, many, of course, these are sort of weakly stable. Uh, some are unstable, but interestingly is there's one which is strictly stable in dimension eight, which is G2 mod out S04. Uh, so previously we thought maybe the sphere is the only one that linearly stable, but that's not the case, at least up to in dimension eight. So here, uh, yeah, so the, okay, so I quickly, you can also do the second variations for uh, shrinking solitons. And uh, well, just twist everything by the F, so I'm not going into uh, details. And so maybe as time is running out, so uh, let me just say, uh, there's a similar result in the kähler ricci soliton case. If the Hodge number H11 is bigger than two, then Hall and Murphy prove that these are linearly unstable. So in this case, you just use the twisted harmonic 1-1 one -one forms in place. And uh, yeah. And there's two particular uh, problems which is still open. The first one was Richard asked uh, back then, is four-dimensional compact stable, linearly stable, uh, positive Einstein one must be S4 or CP2. So high dimension now looks like, of course, there's counterexamples in dimension eight, but low dimensions, particularly four dimension, this should be the case. And I add a little bit uh, to that after discussion with uh, uh, Richard is that uh, possibly all the compact linearly stable ones will be Einstein in all dimensions. That's, uh, and so here are some examples while supporting the conjecture of the first one or the second one is these are all the examples we know in four dimension. 
S4, so the symmetric space S4 CP2 and S2 cross S2. And then we have the two Hermitian uh, two ones where also that you have Einstein, which page metric, and the, the Chern LeBron uh, web Einstein metric. The page metric is 78, and uh, Chern LeBron uh, web is much more recent, uh, 2000, uh, got seven or eight, uh, those things. And then on the same space, of course, we have uh, Kata Ricci Sarotons by Koizo and Wan Zhu. And among these, uh, we uh, only two are stable or weakly stable, and we suspect this will be unstable, but this is not quite known or proven yet. And so that's the thing supports sort of the conjecture, at least in four dimensions. So I, uh, finally, uh, there's uh, a question is hitchin thorpe type. So hitchin thorpe say Einstein case, you have the relation between oil and number and the signature, and in this one, and the question is, does that hold for four-dimensional compact shrinking solitons? And that's still uh, not known. Yeah. Okay, so I thank you. Uh, thank you very much. That was a lovely talk. Learned a bunch of things myself. And are there any questions? No? Well, let's thank our speaker again. Okay, thank you.